Good morning. It's good to be with you here today. I want to thank your pastor, Richard, for inviting me to share from God's Word today. I rejoice with you over his uh, progress and his health, and I'm thankful to you as a church that you uh, have afforded him an opportunity to take sabbatical, and I pray that it will be a, a good time of Sabbath for him and uh, that he will continue to see progress in, in his recovery. Uh, th Jacob, thank you for your comments regarding uh, the Kentucky Baptist Convention and the need to cooperate. I too believe that we're better together and more effective together, and I want to thank you for your uh, cooperation as a church. I, I want to thank you that you personally give generously to your church and I want to thank your church for giving generously to missions through the cooperative program. Uh, you can rejoice today that uh, you have part in over 3,600 international missionaries today being on the field, faithfully sharing the gospel across the globe because of people like you and churches like yours. And so I just want to say thank you. And as a, a regional consultant who lives in Shelbyville and uh, works a region of the state here in this area. I'm able to minister to pastors, church leaders, and churches. I'm able to do consulting and training and provide resources of various types because of that same giving through the cooperative program. So thank you very much. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 10. Uh, and in it, we're going to read a story of a man who experienced some radical change in his life. Uh, he experienced radical change physically. We're going to read about how this blind man was enabled by the power and might of our Lord Jesus to be able to see for the first time physically. Uh, he also experienced a great change uh, spiritually. Uh, his life was different as a result of encountering Jesus. And so, we're going to look at this passage of Scripture, read it, and we're going to see how this applies to our life because like Bartimaeus who experienced this change, uh, we need to experience change in our own life. Uh, would you stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word as we begin reading in verse 46 and read the following verses in Mark 10. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up. He is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and he came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What? Do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight, and he followed him on the way. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Let's join together in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is a lamp unto our feet. Thank you that it's a light unto our path. We pray that you will help us to hide and treasure these words in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Father, we confess our need to change and to grow and to mature. And Father, we pray that through the work of your Holy Spirit that you will pinpoint and remind us of areas in our own lives that need to be changed by your power 
by your might and by your grace. Father, uh, we pray that you will just help us not only to be hearers of the word this morning, but we pray that you will help us to be doers. And so as we focus on this passage, Lord, teach us and remind us of how uh, we need to apply and live out uh, your truth in our life. Father, I want to thank you for Bloomfield Baptist Church, and I want to thank you for the the, the spirit of cooperation that's present here, Lord. I want to thank you for uh, people who pray for the gospel to, uh, to be shared both in this community and to the ends of the earth. And so, Lord, I want to thank you for praying people here at Bloomfield Baptist. I, I, I want to thank you, Lord, for people who are personally engaged in your mission to make disciples here in Bloomfield and to not stop until... Uh, the the all, all nations are impacted and disciples are made among all nations. And so, Lord, thank you for those who are going. And, Lord, I thank you for uh, the generosity of people in this church who give faithfully to Bloomfield Baptist Church to not only support its ministry here, but to uh, support missionaries throughout the world. We pray for our missionaries today, our international missionaries. We pray for encouragement. We pray for the ability to continue to faithfully share the gospel. And we pray, Father, that uh, one day that uh, these people and this church will indeed see the, the impact that their cooperation has had through praying and going and giving faithfully to missions, that the gospel might be proclaimed to the ends of the earth and that disciples might be made among all peoples. Lord, uh, we love you today. We, we thank you that you love us. We thank you, Lord, that you openly displayed your great love for us in sending your Son, our Savior, Jesus. Thank you for his atoning death upon the cross in our place and for our sins. Thank you that when he was placed in that tomb that you raised him up from the dead to indicate that he indeed is the Christ. He is indeed worth following. He indeed is the king of glory. And We pray, Father, that as we live our lives, that our lives would reflect the worthiness of our Savior and King. Lord, uh, we, we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus, and for his sake we pray. Amen. I think all of us want to change in certain areas of our life. I, I think all of us recognize the need for change. We, we realize on the one hand, that God's plan for all of our lives is that we be conformed to the image of Christ, that we bring glory to God as our lives are transformed by the gospel, and in this path of sanctification that daily, monthly, yearly, our lives look more and more like Jesus. And so as we recognize that that is God's plan for our life, to be conformed to the image of God, and then on the other hand, as we realize where we are, and at times how unlike Christ we really are, we recognize and we often desire this, this, these changes that need to take place in our life. But the truth of the matter is, our old sinful nature uh, wants sameness. Uh, we don't want to change. Our old sinful nature doesn't. And yet God calls us to continue to follow Him. He, the late Henry Blackaby once said this. He said, we can't go or follow God and stay right where we are. We must change. We must grow. We must mature. And so my question this morning for all of us here is this, is this question. What in your life needs to change in order that you would fully become all that God wants you to be. 
What bad habit do you need to break and leave and quit? What sin do you need to genuinely confess, forsake, and be free of? What good intention in your life needs to become a real practice? Now we all deal with the frustration of on the one hand wanting to change in certain areas of our life, but often seeing that the reality is not real and lasting change. What good intention in your life needs to become a real practice? What, what spiritual discipline in your life needs to be started or strengthened? How's your prayer life lately? Are you regularly in the Word? Are you an on-mission Christian having conversations with friends and neighbors and people you come in contact with about the gospel and about the Lord Jesus? What spiritual discipline do you need to strengthen or start in your life? How do we experience real, needed, and lasting change in our life? Let's look at this passage, and I want us to look at four things about this passage of Scripture that remind us of how to experience real change. The first one is found in verses 46 and 47. And it is this. We need to call out to Jesus in prayer, realizing that he is the true source of lasting and real change. Uh, here's the picture in verse 46. The scripture says, They came to Jericho, and as they came to Jericho, Jesus was present in a crowd. He had in this crowd his disciples, and there were other people who had heard about Jesus, and they were following him. They entered Jericho. We're not, uh, we, we don't know how long they stayed in Jericho. That's not obviously important to us, but we do know that they came to Jericho and they were leaving. Jesus, his disciples, and a large crowd. And as they were leaving, there was a man who was blind. And he sat beside the road. This was a, a regular practice. Bartimaeus sat beside the road regularly. And because of his blindness, he was unable to work and make a living. And so he, his life was sustained by asking people for help. On many occasions in asking people for help, there were people who would regularly, what I would call, make his day, change his day. Uh, he would ask for perhaps some coins, or he would ask perhaps for some food. And caring, generous people would at times give him some coins that would enable him to go buy food, or uh, they would give him actual food that they or someone in their household had prepared. And he would either think to himself, or he would say out loud, you've impacted my day. You've made my day. You've changed my day. But Bartimaeus realized that there was one who had come to Jericho and was now leaving, that could not only impact his day, but could change his life. And he cried out to him, and he said, Jesus, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy upon me. In our lives, uh, we, like Bartimaeus, can have people who make our day. Uh, you may have had someone recently who spoke a great word of encouragement to you. And you either thought or you said to them, you know what, you've made my day. You might have had someone recently ask you this question, is there a way that I can pray today for you? And you shared with them a prayer request 
And they listened. And they prayed for your need. And you either thought or you said to them, you have made my day. Uh, it is good when we encounter people who make or change our day, but our most desperate need in life is for Jesus to change our very life. The source of change, the real source of change, is Jesus. When we think about what needs changing in our life, the real source is not from within us. It is not the strength that I bring to be able to muster up self-control or initiative. It doesn't come from within me. It doesn't come from the latest self-help book. There are good books on self-help, how to improve, how to change, but the source of real, impactful, and lasting change doesn't come from the latest bestseller. The source of real change comes from the Lord Jesus. He is the one and He alone can not only impact and change our day, but He can impact and change our very life. There's a second thing here. This is found in verses 48 and 49. You will face barriers when you attempt change, but Jesus will help you overcome those barriers. Look at the barriers that Bartimaeus experienced in his life here in verse 48. Now, had we not read verse 48 yet? And had we already read this, the fact that Bartimaeus is seeing Jesus leave Jericho, and he's, he's crying out to him, and he's saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Had we not read the next verse, we might think the next verse might read something like this. And they cleared out a pathway to enable Bartimaeus to get to Jesus. But we don't read that, do we? What do we read? Verse 48. Many rebuked him. Many rebuked him and said to him, Be quiet. Be quiet. If you're familiar with Scripture, this is not the first time that the disciples and the crowds just didn't get it. If you recall, there was a time when uh, people were bringing their children to Jesus. And they sought for Jesus to bless their children. And what did the disciples do at that time? They began to rebuke and turn them away, discouraging these, these parents from bringing their children to Jesus. And Jesus said, bring them to me. Bring them to me. And so here in this passage, rather than the people around Bartimaeus being encouragers, encouraging him toward Jesus, they said, be quiet, hush, implying these things. Jesus is important, you're not. Jesus is busy, he doesn't have time for you. He's got other, more important things to do and to give attention to. Be quiet. And so Bartimaeus on this particular day faced some external barriers. He faced, he faced the, the negative influence of people around him. When you... Uh, are, are sensing the, the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, and He's pinpointing needed change in your life, and you have a desire to move in the direction of, of, of actually living out that change and seeing that become a reality in your life, you may indeed, like Bartimaeus, experience the discouragement of people around you. And they might say things that rather than those things encourage you toward Christ, they might indeed 
They might indeed be a temptation for you to distance yourself from Christ. Bad advice. Bad influence. He doesn't have time for you. He's got more important things and more important people to attend to. And sometimes there are internal barriers. You know, when Bartimaeus heard these words, he had to have heard them and he had to have wrestled with uh, what to do in light of them. And so there was that temptation to, to at least think for a moment on what was being said. Be quiet. And to think at least for a moment on the implication of what they were saying. Does he really care about me? And does he really have time for me? And am I important enough for him to work a work in my life? There was that probably that internal wrestling. And sometimes if we believe uh, if we believe discouraging things, if we believe things that are not true about Jesus, those uh, internal wrestlings that we have can become a barrier because if we have a false belief about Jesus, we won't approach Jesus. If we believe uh, He doesn't care about me, it will impact the way we approach Him in prayer. If we believe uh, he has more important things than to listen to my prayer today, then we might not pray. And so it's important in those times to turn to the source of real and lasting change, and that is Jesus. And that's exactly what Bartimaeus did. Rather than listen and abide by the discouraging words, be quiet, verse 48 says, but he shouted all the more. He just got louder. <laughs> and he said it more often. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And in this experience with Jesus, he, he, he understood the truth. Jesus cares. Jesus cares cares. The scripture says this, cast all of your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. He cares for you. Let's say that together. He cares for you. Let's say it again. He cares for you. Would you turn to the person beside of you and say to them, Jesus cares for you. And as we think about this, this, these verses here, we think about the we think about the reality that in Bartimaeus's life, he got advice that he didn't ask for. You know, throughout life, uh, there will be people who will give us advice. As a matter of fact, uh, the Scripture says we ought to seek counsel and we ought to seek advice Proverbs 15 22 says this without counsel plans fail but with many advisors they succeed uh, Proverbs 12 5 says the thoughts of the righteous are are just but the counsels of the wicked are deceitful throughout life we'll we'll receive counsel sometimes it will be Counsel that we'll ask for. What? Give me your thoughts on this. Scripture says that I need to seek counsel, so that's what I'm doing. Give me your thoughts on this. Sometimes we'll seek counsel, and rightly so. Sometimes we'll be given counsel or advice, and we won't ask for it. And either time, whether we ask for it or we're given it without asking, we always have to filter it. We have to filter it through these questions. Is this advice consistent with what Scripture teaches? Is this advice consistent with what I know is true about Jesus? Is this advice advice that's going to encourage me toward 
a closer walk and relationship with Jesus? Or is this advice such that it is going to uh, impact negatively my walk or my relationship with Jesus? I think another question that we need to ask when giving advice is this. Where is the person that's giving me this advice? Where do they stand in relationship to Jesus right now? I want advice from people who are walking with God and who are glorifying Jesus with their own lives, don't you? I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant and often discount advice that's given by someone that either doesn't know Christ or is not walking with Christ at the time. You will face barriers. Some of them will be external through other people. Sometimes internal as you wrestle with spiritual warfare, things you're thinking that aren't true, and sometimes things that aren't true that come through other people. Those can be barriers to us seeking the true source of real change, and that is Jesus. But if we turn to Christ, He will help us to overcome these barriers. There's the third thing. Jesus will ask you to get specific about what needs to change in your life. Here's the picture. Great crowd. Bartimaeus yells out. The disciples around say to him, be quiet. Instead of becoming silent, he becomes louder and cries out to Jesus. And Jesus' response was this. Call him. Call him. And those who were at one point discouraging Bartimaeus now are really forced to say, he's calling you. He's calling you. And Bartimaeus is led to Jesus. And I want you to get in your, in your mind this picture. It's the picture of the creator of the universe standing, stopping with all of the needs of this vast crowd of people that are following him and that are still remaining around him from the town of Jericho. He's stopping. He's staring into the face of one who cannot yet see him in return. And he asks him this question. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? When we read the New Testament, we realize this about Jesus. Jesus often asks questions. As a matter of fact, he asked about 307 questions as we read the New Testament. Martin Copenhaver in the book called Jesus is the Question said that uh, Jesus uh, asked some 307. Uh, he, he was asked by other people about 183 and chose to answer less than 10. And he said Jesus was about 40 times more likely to ask a question of someone than he was to answer a question asked by someone. And that's the same way here. What do you want me to do for you? I, I want you to note this about this question. This was not the first time in Scripture Jesus asked this question. As a matter of fact, it's the second time in this chapter that Jesus asked this question. If you go to verse 36 in Mark 10, uh, it tells us here that, or th verse 35, 
James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus and they said to Jesus, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. So this was sort of initiated first, this conversation was, by, the, by these two disciples who said, Jesus, we'd, we'd like for you to do whatever, you, uh, whatever we ask of you. But here was Jesus' response. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? And they, that is, James and John said to him, Grant that one of us would sit on your right hand and one of us would sit on your left hand in glory. And Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to him, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized, but to sit at my right hand or on my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. So it wasn't the only time that Jesus asked this question, what do you want me to do for you? But there's a stark contrast in the response of these two disciples and in the response of blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus' response was this. I, I, I want to see. As a matter of fact, he's, he put it this way. Rabbi or Rabboni in Greek, I, I want to see. And Jesus, Jesus worked in his life in a miraculous way to allow him and to make him to be able to see. Can you imagine if you were born and lived your entire life blind? Can you imagine having your eyes opened and illuminated and the first face that you would see would be the face of the Lord Jesus. Imagine the joy. Imagine the joy of, of being able to see for the first time. Imagine the joy of seeing the first person, the first impression you saw was the would be the face of the creator of the universe, the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you want me to do for you? I, I want you to realize, first of all, this, this is not a Santa Claus-like question that Jesus would ask Bartimaeus or that he would ask us. What do you want me to do for you? It's not to be answered in a self-centered way. And by the way, when James and John initiated and said, we'd like for you to do whatever we ask, and then their response was, we'd like to sit on each side of you in glory. That response that Jesus evokes from us should not center in ourselves, but it should center in what do I want God to do in my life? What change do I want Him to bring about in my life that if He gave that, if He worked that, if He transformed my life in that way that my life would look more like Jesus and that my life would bring greater glory to Him and that I would fulfill in a greater way my full potential and purpose for being in Christ and on this earth. What do I want God to do in my life? 
As we read this, realize this, that the Lord Jesus asked us this question. What do you want me to do in your life? It's, it's a similar question to the question that we sometimes ask other people. How can I pray for you? Have you ever asked somebody the question, how can I pray for you? And, and it was sort of difficult for that person to immediately respond. I've had that occur, and I've, I, I've, I've followed up with something like this. If, if I were to ask God to work in your life today, what do I need to ask Him on your behalf? Same question. What do you want Jesus to do in your life today? What needs to change in my life that would in turn glorify God and honor the Lord Jesus? There's a fourth thing here. Verse 52. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and he followed him on the way. Jesus works in response to our faith in him. And therefore we need to trust him by faith to do what only he can do. Only Jesus could make blind eyes see. And in healing this man of his blindness, it was an outward picture of what Jesus was doing in his life spiritually. Because this man was not only encountering physical darkness of being unable to see family, friends, and Jesus, but this man had experienced the darkness of not knowing Christ until this day. And on this day, he expressed faith. How was his faith expressed? Well, the scripture says to us that when Jesus passed by, this is how he called out to him. Jesus, son of David, son of David, have mercy on me. That phrase, son of David, was it originated with the prophets who said that the Christ would come from the lineage of David. And so when Bartimaeus is crying out, don't overlook this phrase, don't overlook this title that he's calling Jesus. He's calling him son of David. He's saying, it's really a statement of faith. He's saying, I don't doubt who you are, Jesus. I don't have to ask, are you the one or do we look for another? You are in my mind, you are the one. You are the Christ. You're the one that's been anticipated. You're the one that the prophets have declared was to come. You are the son of David. It's faith. When Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Here's how he prefaced his statement. Rabbi, I, I, Greek, Rabboni, used another time in Scripture in John chapter 20 when Mary comes to the tomb and Jesus, uh, the resurrected Christ, is there and as he speaks for the first time to her, she turns and she says, Rabboni, as if to say, Master, Lord. And this is what this is what Bartimaeus is saying. He's not just referring to him as a teacher like others. He's, he's saying, Master, Lord, you're the Christ, Son of David, Rabboni, Master, Lord. And Jesus has worked in 
Bartimaeus' life. Bartimaeus's, Bartimaeus responds in faith to Jesus. And this outward indicator that he can see physically is an outward indicator of what Jesus has done in the life of this man spiritually. Your faith has made you whole. Go on your way. And as he went, you know, you'd think go on your way might mean uh, go ahead and go back to your home, but the Scripture says that Bartimaeus followed him on the way. His life was different. His life has changed, transformed, physically and spiritually. Healed of physical blindness. Healed of spiritual blindness. Experiencing real and lasting change that would cause a man to follow Jesus. Lasting change that would save by his very life. You tell me I'm too unimportant to cry out to him, I'll tell you this, he's too important for me not to cry out to him. And I'll continue to cry out to him, and I will continue to follow him. That is the change we need. Our greatest change in life is the need to change from being what the Scripture calls an enemy of God. And the Bible says we're, we, we're, we were all at one time, if we're not saved, we, we were all enemies. Or we, If you're not saved and you've not believed in Christ, the Scripture uses this term, at enmity or in the enemies of God. We need to be changed by the power of the Gospel. Our hearts and our lives need to be transformed by the very one who can change us, and that is Jesus. We need Jesus. And whether life or people try to discourage us from crying out to Him, the very thing we most need is to cry out to the One who can save us from our sin and change us from being enemies of His, sinners who live apart from Him to become children of His through faith in Him. We need Him. And so I'll close this morning by asking this question again. What needs to change in your life? This morning as we enter into this time of invitation, I pray that you would bring that question with its answer. That very thing that God has been working in your life Prior to today, today's just a reminder. This is an area of my life that needs to change. If God's plan for me is that I be conformed to the image of Jesus, then this is an area of my life that I need the Lord Jesus to work in powerful ways. Come to Him this morning. Cry out to Jesus this morning. Call upon Him. If you're here today and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, you know about Him, but you've never confessed your sins, you've never repented of your sins, you've never really believed that, that Jesus is the Christ, that He died upon the cross not just for a world out there, but He died on the cross for you. He, he took your place. He took the punishment that you and I deserve. He, he died in our place. Believe in Him today. Turn from sin. Trust Jesus by faith. Would you stand with me and join in prayer with me?